Okay, welcome to natural language processing. Uh, the next topic is text classification. So what is text classification? We want to assign uh, documents uh, to predefined categories. For example, based on topics such as, let's say, science and technology versus music, based on languages, based on different users. So we're given a set of classes, capital C, and we're given a document X, and we have to determine which class in C it belongs to. There are many different ways to do classification. Uh, the first important distinction between them is uh, whether you want to do hierarchical versus flat classification. So in hierarchical classification, you have a more general topic, for example, let's say business. Then within business, you have some additional subcategories, for example, finance and management and so on. In flat classification, you just have one set of uh, categories that is not hierarchical. You can also distinguish between overlapping and non-overlapping classification. So in overlapping classification, which is also known as soft classification, each document can be classified in multiple classes. So for example, a document about uh, the business of sports may be classified under both business and sports. Whereas in non-overlapping classification, you have to make a hard decision and classify each document in exactly one class. So there are many different techniques for classifications. One is uh, to use manual classification using a set of rules. So you can have, for example, a list of all the countries in the world, all the states in the United States. And then if a document contains a mention of those countries or states, you can classify them under geography, for example. Uh, so here's an example. You can have a rule that says, if you have the word Columbia and the word university, you classify under education because Columbia University is a university. But if you have Columbia and South Carolina, you want to classify this document under geography because Columbia is the capital of South Carolina. So here are some of the popular techniques for classification. They fall into two general categories. Uh, one is the so-called generative models, which include k-nearest neighbors and naive Bayes. And another one is discriminative, which includes SVMs or support vector machines and regression. So in generative classification, you have to model the joint probability of X and Y, where X is the document and Y is the class. And then you use Bayesian prediction to compute the probability of the class given the document. In discriminative classification, you have to model uh, the probability of Y given X directly without using the joint probability. So for document classification and also for clustering, which is one of the topics that we'll cover later on, the documents are represented exactly the same way as for document retrieval. So typically use the vector-based representation, have words, you know, like cat and dog, and each of those corresponds to a single dimension in the vector space. And you can also use as dimensions things like uh, uh, document length and author name and other metadata features in addition to the words themselves. So each document is represented as a vector in an n-dimensional space, and the idea is that similar documents are going to appear nearby in the vector space. So you have to use distance measures such as the ones used for document retrieval, such as uh, cosine similarity, the Jacquard coefficient, and so on. So let's look at naive Bayesian classification. Naive Bayesian classification, you have a very simple uh, idea. Uh, we have looked at this example before under text summarization, so you can skip this slide if you remember it. Uh, here I'm going to describe it in a slightly different way that is directly relevant to document classification. So what is the setup? We're given a document D, and we want to find out what is the probability that this document belongs to a certain class C, given that it includes uh, features F1 to Fk. So according to the Bayesian formula, we can rewrite this formula as the probability of the feature set, given that the document is in the class, and then normalized by the probability of the document being in the class in the first place, divided by the probability of seeing uh, this particular combination of features. So now, given that we have a joint uh, probability distribution of all the features, uh, we typically run into pause if we have a lot of different features. So we want to use the naive uh, Bayesian assumption and assume that the features are statistically independent. So in that case, uh, the formula changes into the one below. So the probability of the document being in the class given the features that describe it is just going to be equal to the product of all of the conditional probabilities for each individual feature given the document is in the class times the probability that the document is in the class. This whole product divided by the product of the probabilities of the individual features. So the features are typically words and phrases and sometimes metadata. Uh, 
So some of the issues with uh, naive base that we have to solve are where do we get the values? Well, for example, how do we find the probability that the document is in a particular class? So for this purpose, we use maximum likelihood estimation, which is dividing the number of times that it appears in the class in the training data by the total number of documents in the collection. So we can also compute the conditional probabilities in a similar way. We assume that uh, they're uh, generated using a multinomial generator. The maximum likelihood estimator is just going to be uh, the number of times they appear divided by the total number of occurrences. So we need to do smoothing just like in uh, the statistical parsing section of the class if the frequencies are low. And one possible type of smoothing that can be used is Laplacian smoothing where we add one count to each of the occurrences and then we divide um, by a normalized uh, sum. So it's very important when you do naive base uh, to implement uh, everything correctly. Since you're going to be multiplying a lot of small numbers, you may run into floating point underflow. And in that case, it's much better to take the logarithms of each of those values. So instead of having something like 10 to the minus 30th power, you would just have the number minus 30. And then if you want to multiply multiple values in the uh, numbers uh, space, in the logarithmic space, you will just have to add the logarithms. So let's look at the specific example of uh, text classification, uh, the problem of spam recognition. So here is a message that many of you have, may have received uh, some years back. Uh, you get an email sent uh, randomly to you that says, uh, I'm sick and I want you to help me uh, uh, save my investments. I'm going to give you a commission, but in order to do this, you have to first send me some uh, deposit so that I can use it to withdraw the money from my bank. So those are very typical examples of spam messages. So how do you recognize spam automatically using text classification? Well, there are techniques based on naive Bayesian classification, such as Spam Assassin. It's an open source uh, project as a part of the Apache Foundation. So if you go to the website that corresponds to uh, Spam Assassin, you can look at the different tests that it performs on every message that gets sent through email to you. So those tests are essentially ways to compute features, which are then combined together to determine the score of a message. So here's some examples. Does the body incorporate a tracking ID number? If yes, then a certain number of points will be added to the spam score for that document. Looking at the body of the email message, are the HTML and text parts different? Again, if yes, that indicates a larger probability that this document is a spam message. Header, is the date three to six hours before the received date? So that means that there has been a large uh, mailing to many different recipients and the messages got delayed. So again, this is another feature that indicates that the message may be spam. So here's some more examples. Uh, the body, uh, the HTML font size is huge. Uh, there's an attempt to obfuscate words in the subject. So for example, you take some common word that appears in spam emails and you replace the letter I with an exclamation point or something like that so that uh, spam filters just looking for that particular word are not going to catch it. And you can also have different sorts of regular expressions that correspond to some of the most typical spam messages. So for example, anything that includes urgent, transfer of money, warning, uh, reply proposal, notification, and so on, and dollar amounts is going to be labeled as spam. So how do we determine which features are important to include in the naive base classifier? Not every feature is important. So some features may in fact be completely irrelevant to the classification process. So one of the techniques that is used a lot is the so-called chi-square test. So chi-square is this capital Greek letter chi, and it's computed in the following way. You're given a specific term or feature, T, and then you want to compute how many times that feature appears uh, in relation to the number of occurrences of each of the individual classes. So let me explain what this table represents. C0 means that uh, the particular document is not uh, spam. C equals 1 means that the document is spam. I sub T equals 0 means that that particular term or feature is not present in the document. And I T equals 1 means that that particular feature is present in the document. So we have, again, four cells in this contingency table. 
So we can check whether the feature and the class are independent. If the probability of, for example, getting the class z equals zero and the feature equals zero is equal to the probability of one times the probability of the other, that means that the two are independent. Uh, the more different the two are, uh, the more likely it is that that feature is informative about that particular class. And if uh, the probability of the, the joint probability is larger than the product of the marginal probabilities, that means that the feature is positively correlated with the class. And if it is negative, that means that the feature is negatively correlated with the class or it's positively correlated with a negative class. So we can uh, compute those probabilities on the contingency table. So for example, the probability that the class is zero is just the sum of the counts for K0, 0, and K01 normalized by N, where N is the total number of documents. Uh, the probability of class equals one is just the sum of the values in the second row, K10 plus K11 divided by N. The probability of i t equals zero is equal to k zero zero plus k one zero again normalized by n and so on. So how do we compute the chi square value? Well, there's a very simple formula for it, which is given here. You just plug in the values of the numbers on the two diagonals, k zero zero and k one one, and then k one zero and k zero one, and you also plug in n, which is the sum of all the different k's. So the value that you get here is uh, the chi square score for the uh, particular feature. High values of chi-square indicate lower belief in independence, which also means that that feature is important and indicative of the positive class. So typically a chi-square value of 5, 6, or 10 means that this feature is very good and should be included in the classification process. So in practice what you want to do is to compute the chi-square value for all the words or features and to pick the top k among them. And you, another important criterion is since you're computing those numbers from the training set, you can always run into a risk that those words may not even appear in the test set. So that's why it's important not just to pick the words or the features that have high chi-square values, but you also want to pick some that have relatively small yet non-zero chi-square values, but which are likely to appear in the test set. So let's uh, quickly look at some of the most well-known data sets used for text classification evaluation. Those include 20 news groups, uh, which is uh, a collection of uh, articles on the Usenet uh, groups on uh, sports and politics and technology. Reuters 21578, which is a collection of about 20,000 documents from Reuters collected in different, uh, from different categories. Uh, those are mostly business news articles about uh, uh, future exchanges. Uh, WebKB, which can be extracted from uh, the CMU website, has to deal with uh, web pages about departments and people and courses. And RCV1 is a Reuters collection which has many more documents than the original Reuters 21578. So how do we evaluate text classification? Uh, one possibility is to do micro-averaging of all the uh, performances for each of the classes or macro-averaging which just means to use a pool table of the performances. So let's look a little bit more at vector space classification. So we have um, some other techniques that are not based on naive base. We have in this example here x1 as one of the dimensions, so that corresponds to one of the terms in the documents, and x2 is uh, another dimension. And we have documents representing vector spaces being of one of the two classes. For example, topic one is represented as red circles and topic two is represented as stars. So in vector space classification, we want to find some decision boundary that separates the circles from the stars. So one possibility is to just take uh, a marker and circle uh, the elements that belong to one of the classes uh, and decide that this is the decision boundary. So the problem is that if you build this kind of decision boundary on the training data, uh, it will not uh, be working correctly on the test data because of overfitting. It will be too specific to the training data. So it's important to come up with a decision surface that has relatively small complexities. For example, a, a straight line or hyperplane rather than something that cannot be described in a few parameters. So one possibility is to use decision trees in vector space. So we can have a set of horizontal and vertical lines in this example. And we can have a classifier that says 
looking at the vertical dotted line. If uh, the document is to the right of that dotted line, then classify it as a star. Else, now we are starting to look at the two horizontal lines. If it's above the upper horizontal line classified as a star, if it's below the lower horizontal line classified as a star, and else classified as a circle. So in this case, we're going to have a decision tree with uh, four nodes, and each of the nodes will correspond to uh, one of the classes unambiguously, either the star or the circle. So obviously, it's much better to come up with a linear boundary uh, so that we don't overfit the data. So in this example here, we have a straight line that corresponds to the decision boundary. And as you can probably notice easily, it makes a mistake. Uh, it, it classifies correctly seven out of the eight documents, but it uh, incorrectly labels one of the documents as a circle, even though it's actually a star. So let's look at some examples of different vector space classifiers. So one of the techniques that is used is to build a centroid for each of the clusters. So just to remind you, the centroid is a vector that corresponds to the weighted sum of all the vectors that belong to the class. And then we want to build a line, a straight line, that is equidistant from the two centroids, or hyperplane that's equidistant from the two centroids as the decision boundary. So if uh, the decision boundary is given in the equation w1x1 plus w2x2 equals b, uh, let me explain what are those uh, values. So w1 and w2 are weights, x1 and x2 are the coordinates of the vector in the two dimensions x1 and xb, and b is the so-called bias. If b is equal to zero, we're essentially saying that the two classes are don't have any prior uh, distinction between them. And if B is different, then it can be in favor of one or the two classes by default. So uh, W1 X1 plus W2 X2 equals B is the equation of a line that separates the two classes. Then if for any new document, we have a value of W1 X1 plus W2 X2 greater than B, that means that it's classified in the positive class. And similarly, if it's less than B, we classify it in the negative class. So in the most general case, in n-dimensional spaces, uh, we have uh, an extension of the same formula. We just have uh, the weight vector transposed to multiply the dot product with the x vector of the document. And we want to check if the result is b, in which case the document falls on the decision boundary, or if it's greater than or less than b, in which case we can classify it. So let's look at an example in two-dimensional space. The decision boundary that corresponds uh, to the two classes in here, even though it has an error, uh, is the dotted line. And then it corresponds to the normal vector w, uh, which is orthogonal to the decision boundary. So if we have a new document that is, for example, the uh, star that appears lowest on this page, its uh, dot product with the weight vector is going to be positive because the angle is less than 90 degrees, and therefore it will be labeled as uh, class star. And if uh, we have one of the circles, each of those is going to have an angle greater than 90 degrees with the weight vector, and therefore it will be labeled in the circle class. So let's see how we can do this in practice with some specific numbers. So what is the setting? The setting is that we already have the weight vectors that correspond to the decision boundary, and we receive a new document, and we want to decide how to classify it. So here are the weights. We have two columns that correspond to uh, the words A to F, which have positive weights because they are associated with the positive class. And then a set of words G to L with negative weights that correspond to the negative class. And let's assume for simplicity that the bias is equal to zero. So now a new document comes in, uh, which has one instance of the word A, one instance of word D, and one E and one H. So how do we classify this document? Well, we can essentially compute the dot product of this vector with the weight vector. And here's how this is done. Uh, 0.6 times 1 means that the word A appears once in the document, and its weight in the decision boundary vector is 0.6. Then we have 0.4 times 1 for D, uh, which also appears in the left column. And then 0.4 times 1 for word E. And finally, for h, which is in the other column, we have minus 0.5 times 1. If we add all those numbers together, we get a score of 0 0.9, uh, which is greater than 0. And therefore, we're going to classify this document in the positive class. I mean, this should be pretty obvious by looking at the table. If instead of e, we had g, 
then there would be a lot more evidence in favor of the negative class and we would therefore classify the document in the negative class. And let's look very quickly at a very important algorithm called the perceptron algorithm that is used in uh, machine learning for classification. Uh, obviously, uh, this is not the right class to discuss it in detail. You can take a class on machine learning to find out more about it. I'm just going to sketch uh, its uh, use. So for the perceptron, we have as input the following data, S, which is a set of uh, training vectors and their classes. So X1 is a vector of a document that was labeled with Y1, where one being one corresponds to the positive class, Y1 equals minus one corresponds to the negative class. We have N such training examples, and we also have a parameter eta, which is used to determine how fast the algorithm is going to converge. The algorithm itself is just seven or eight lines of code. Here's how it works. Our goal, remember, is to learn the set of weights, W, and we're going to do this in an iterative fashion. We are first going to assign a, a value of zero to all of the weights. So that is uh, the zeroth iteration of W. And we're going to assign zero to K. K is just the number of steps that we have taken. Then we're going to repeat n times the following code. We're going to take the ith element in the data and we are going to check if uh, the class that is assigned to the document y sub i matches uh, the dot product between the weight and the document itself. So if the two are the same, that means that the product is going to be greater than zero. And if the two are different, that means one positive, one negative, then the dot product is going to be less than zero. So what does it mean if the product is less than or equal to zero? That means that uh, y1 has a different sign than the product w uh, times x, which means that we have a mismatch in the classification process. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to readjust the weight vector for the k plus first iteration by starting with the version of it in the kth iteration and adding to it eta times y sub i times x sub i. And then we're going to increase the number k of the number of iterations. So once this algorithm uh, stops after any iteration, we're going to produce uh, W sub K. Uh, so that's the set of weights. Uh, now let's see this in practice. We have an example here from uh, Chris Bishop. So here's how it works. We have a decision boundary that is the black line that separates the two classes, black, um, sorry, the red and the blue classes. Now obviously it doesn't do a very good job at this point because we have uh, blue and red uh, dots on both sides of the line. We want somehow to rotate this line so that all the blue dots are on one side and all the red dots are on the other side. So we're going to pick one of the dots, let's say the one that is circled in green, and we realize that for this dot the decision boundary makes a classification mistake. It labels it in the blue cluster whereas the point is red. So what's going to happen is that now we're going to change the uh, decision boundary by moving the vector, by adding uh, the red vector to the black vector and get a new black vector that corresponds to the normal of the uh, decision boundary. So the new uh, normal vector is now shown on the right hand side and the corresponding decision boundary has rotated from the original one. Now we still have mistakes. We have both uh, red and blue dots on both sides of the curve. Now we take the next misclassified dot, the one again shown in green, and we'll do the same thing. We add the vector that corresponds to that dot to the current normal vector. Uh, so the red arrow that points to the green circle, we add it to the black vector and we get a new red vector. So that means that we rotate the decision boundary one more time. And in this case, we can stop because uh, we have uh, a decision boundary that correctly classifies the red dots from the blue dots. So whatever the normal vector is here, those are the sets of weights that we want to return as part of this algorithm. Okay, so this concludes the section about the perceptron. Uh, let's quickly look at one more technique for text classification, namely the generative model known as k-nearest neighbor. So in k-nearest neighbors, what we want to do is to take each of the uh, vectors in the training data and to figure out what uh, other vectors it is closest to. Uh, 
and then we want to classify each vector based on the majority of the vectors that are closest to it. So it's so-called k nearest neighbors, where k is typically an odd number so that there is no equality. So here's how we do this. We can compute the score uh, for a cluster and a document, uh, C and D, uh, using a sum of a bias for the class, some sort of prior belief that a, a random document is, belongs to that class, plus the sum uh, of all the documents that are in the k nearest neighbors of the document that we're trying to classify and the similarity of that document to those neighbors. And then we can rank the classes based on the score. It's very easy to program the k nearest neighbor as algorithm. Uh, however, there's some issues. We need to figure out what are the values of k and b. Uh, k, again, has to be an odd number. Uh, it shouldn't be 1, typically. Uh, the values of 3 and 5 often work reasonably well. And the value of b is the bias, which again corresponds to uh, the prior belief that that particular class is more frequent than the others. And uh, there's a nice online demo of uh, k nearest neighbors at this URL here. So I'm going to stop here uh, with this segment, and we're going to continue uh, soon with the next one.